Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Again, I'm going to read this, give you a, an introduction as is my normal way of teaching, and then try to go verse by verse to look at this very powerful portion of Scripture. So beginning at verse 15 in the book of Colossians, reading to verse 23, chapter 1, Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated, enemies in your mind, by wicked works. Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight if indeed you continue in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I Paul became a minister and so Paul wrote this particular letter with a distinct purpose. As I've mentioned to you, every book of the Bible has a reason for being written. All the books of the New Testament have a reason for being written, and every letter that we find written by Paul had a purpose. And Colossians was written in order that he might clarify what real or true doctrine is, what truth is. And that's because false teachings were entering the church. Error was beginning to creep in. Now, somebody asked the question, why is doctrine so important? What is proper theology, and, and how do we know that it's true? With so many churches and denominations, who can really know what is right or what is wrong? Well, over the years, the church has developed what are called core essentials of belief. There are certain things that we hold to that are essential to our faith. You have things that are distinctly important and other things that are what we would call peripheral. There are things that are essential to believe because if you don't believe these things, you're not saved. And there are other things that are simply things that have, have um, risen through years and through traditions and, and the way we do things and all of that. That really, that really aren't essentials to salvation. They're things that we do, but not necessarily that important. You can go to church in the United States and, and churches, by and large, will start at the right, right around the same time. Many of the churches will keep the same kind of hour, hour and a half. You know, there are things that are not essential. It's just the way we do things. But there are other things that are very essential. There are core beliefs that we need to not only know, but we need to hold fast to because these essentials provide us with a framework. They help us to organize our faith. Now, in, in, in some basic way, for a Christian, uh, it is Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, the glory of God alone, and our faith is hinged on Scripture alone. That's because it's through Scripture that we see Jesus and not man's tradition. When you speak of the Bible, we speak of it as if it's a, a single book. We say, well, I'm carrying my Bible, but we need to remember that, in fact, the Bible is composed of 66 books written by 40 different writers, and those writers included kings and prophets, fishermen and farmers, doctors, tax collectors, and rabbis. That the Bible was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, over 1,500 years from three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. And yet it has one consistent storyline, salvation, one consistent central figure, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so we look at the Bible alone, the scriptures alone, and we trust in God alone because of the Bible. It's the source of our belief. It's the source of what we practice. 
When Paul was writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he said to that church, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So we trust in the word of God. We trust in the reliability of God to not only give, but to preserve his word to us. It's like what Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. So it's God revealing himself to us that gave us the escape plan. We have a relationship with God because we trust in the scriptures. Now there's something called truth, and Paul is concerned for the church because false teachers are creeping in. And as these false teachers are beginning to come to church, they're bringing error concerning Jesus. And as they bring in their error concerning Jesus, they're undermining the church in its walk with God. You know, many of the Bibles have to deal with error that crept in. You read the book of First and Second Corinthians, and Paul had to deal with error. You look at the, the book of Galatians and Ephesians. You, you look at First and Second Thessalonians, and Paul had to deal with error. First and Second Timothy dealt with error. The book of Titus dealt with error. The book of Hebrews dealt with error. First and Second Peter, First John, all of these books dealt with error that was creeping into the church. You see, false teachers entering into the church were common. So the church was warned over and over again. Jesus himself said that the central thing, the number one sign that we were in the last days would be a consistent false teaching. He made it very clear. Be aware. Do not be deceived. False teachers will enter in. And the other writers of the New Testament spoke concerning of error entering into the church. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 2 said there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Denying the Lord who bought them. This error is going to center on who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ has done. So false teaching, entering the church, creates a problem. The Bible is God's word to man. It reveals to man the true God, the God who removes spiritual darkness. In Psalm 119, 130, it reads, the entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And so we need the truth, and the truth will set us free. And Paul is writing to the Colossians because error is entering into the church. And he's telling them, these are the essentials to believe, and this is the one whom you must believe in Jesus Christ. And Paul is going to be speaking concerning that in just a moment. So as we began our study of Colossians, Paul began his letter by emphasizing that Colossians, the Colossians had faith, love, and hope. They had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They had love for people. They have hope for eternity. And this faith, love, and hope didn't come through humanistic philosophy. It didn't come through deceit or traditions. It didn't come by worldly wisdom. This, this faith and love, this hope, all came through the word of truth of the gospel. He said, which reveals the grace of God in truth. Genuine faith, pure love, and settled hope for eternity will come no other way. You see, mysticism and Jewish legalism and Greek philosophy was seeping in. It was beginning to pollute the church. And one error entering in taught that Jesus was not God in the flesh, but a being less than God. And Paul is dealing with that here in the book of Colossians. You see, believing that Jesus is God in the flesh is what is called an essential an essential of the faith. You cannot be a Christian if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. You're not a Christian if you don't believe that. That is what is an essential. In John 8, 23 and 24, Jesus said, you are from beneath, I'm from above. You are of this world, I'm not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you'll die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And so it's an essential to believe in who Jesus Christ is. And this is a sticking point with other re world religions. It's a, a, it's a, a bone of contention uh, with pseudo-Christian cults. 
If you speak to a Mormon, a Mormon will tell you that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. If you speak to a Jehovah's Witness, a Jehovah's Witness will tell you that Jesus is Michael, the archangel, first creation of God. Buddhists will say that Jesus was an enlightened soul with compassion for those lost in the cycle of reincarnation. Some Hindus think that Jesus learned yoga, became a guru to the Jews, and he died in order to reincarnate. Muslims don't believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross. Their Quran in chapter 4, verses 156 and 157 reads, they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him, but they thought they did. God lifted him up to his presence. God is almighty, all wise. Muslims don't believe that Jesus is the son of God because the Quran says, say God is unique. God, the source of everything. He, is not, he has not fathered anyone, nor was he fathered. And there is nothing comparable to him. That's Quran 112, verses 1 through 4. They say it is not befitting to the majesty of God that he should beget a son. Glory be to him. When he determines a matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. That's in the Quran, chapter 19, verses 34 and 35. They don't believe that Jesus died on the cross, nor do they believe that he is the Son of God. Well, that's not new. Some were saying Jesus is not God in the flesh during the time of the writing of Colossians. So Paul is presenting here in these verses the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, he's already said that Jesus delivered us from darkness and conveyed us into his kingdom. In other words, he rescued us from Satan's kingdom. He brought us to safety, to peace, joy, and hope in him. And he did this by redemption. He paid the price of salvation by pouring out his life for man. And forgiveness came through our receiving Christ as Savior, being washed by his blood. So to establish that Jesus is God incarnate, Paul reveals his greatness, and he's doing so in these verses through what is called a hymn, a song of praise. That's intended to reveal that Jesus is preeminent and that we need no one else but him. The first stanza is found in verses 15 through 17. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So that's the first stanza. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, he says, over all creation. When Paul says he's the image, that's a Greek word, icon, and the word is translated essential embodiment. He is real. He is the likeness. You see, he's saying in, in Jesus, God's nature and being have been perfectly revealed. The invisible has been made visible. Now that's in accordance with Old Testament, pro Testament prophecy. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says it like this. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So Jesus in the Old Testament is prophesied as God, the Mighty God. In the New Testament... Well, while the New Testament clearly presents Jesus as God in the flesh. If you've been with us on Wednesday night, we've been going through the Gospel of John. In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. When you get to verse 14, he goes on to say, The Word was made flesh, dwelt amongst us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he says, The Word became flesh, this Word that is God, incarnated. When Paul was writing to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 6, he said, speaking of Jesus, being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, said that God in, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on, on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ is presented in the scriptures as God in the flesh. Now when he's speaking of him in verse 15, he says he's the image of the invisible God. He also refers to him as the firstborn 
over all creation. Now, when he says the firstborn, that's, a, that's speaking of position. He's got the position of prominence. He has preeminence over all creation. It's a word that's spoken of in order to give him the prominence that he deserves. It's like when the psalmist in Psalm 89, verse 27, spoke of King David and said, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. It's a position of prominence. And so Jesus Christ is not being spoken of as the firstborn of all creation in the sense of a, a literal birth, but rather he has priority over, he has prominence over all creation. In verses 16 and 17, by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He's before all things and in him all things consist. And so he makes it very clear that, that Jesus Christ is the creator of all things. In Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Again in John, in chapter 1, verse 3, it said, All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now this all things includes the angelic host. And that's why we're subject to him. And that's why they are subject to him. And this is why we don't worship angels. Now, there are those who, who do do, but the Scripture teaches us that we're not to. We're not to have anything that goes before Jesus Christ, anything at all. And yet there are those who will pray to angels and have a, a worshipful experience towards them and all. But the Bible doesn't teach that. Angels were created beings or intended to minister to the heirs of salvation, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Angels can't be saved. When an angel fell, he remain, remains fallen. There is no redeeming of angels into them once again being righteous or having an ability to be in the presence of God as one of his servants. That doesn't happen. When an angel fell, he has fallen for eternity. And those that remained faithful are faithful for eternity. They don't understand salvation because they are not saved. Human beings are saved. And angels are not to be worshipped by human beings. No other no other. Uh, created thing is to be worshipped uh, other than Jesus. Uh, uh, no other thing should be that is created is worshipped. The only one that is worshipped is Jesus Christ. Now sometimes we get caught up thinking, well, this was a holy person. I should speak to them even though they're dead. The Bible doesn't teach that we do that either. There's one intercessor be be between men and, and, and God, and that's the man Christ Jesus. That includes uh, Mary. That includes Joseph. That includes everybody. I uh, it's only Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. I, I remember when my wife, Marie, and I were starting to date. Marie had, um, she had this thing for St. Joseph. And she had a little statue on her, on her, on her dashboard and the car of St. Joseph. And he was facing traffic. But his hands were over his eyes. No, they, they weren't. Uh, he melted in the sun. So he's like a little hunchback, you know, they're looking at traffic, you know, and, 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 and you, don't, you don't create something to worship. God created us that we might worship him, but you, you don't worship something that is created. You don't worship the angels. You don't worship uh, saints. You worship only Jesus Christ, see? And... Um, it's a very important thing for us to understand and to realize today because there's a lot of glory that's taken from the Lord when you start giving it to created things. But Jesus Christ signed on a cross that he might draw me to his Father. And my worship should go to God through Jesus Christ because he's that one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And, and that's how it's supposed to be in our Christian faith. And so you don't worship anything other than God. The all things that were created includes the angelic hosts. That's why they're subject to him. In verse 17, it says, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. When it says he's before all things, he's the uncreated creator. He has no beginning, is what Paul is saying. He is before all things. This reminds us of Micah 5, verse 2, the scripture that we use during uh, Christmas where it says, You Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me 
the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, of old, from everlasting, from beyond the vanishing point. He's speaking of Christ who has not been created. You see, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, notice, who keeps all things together. It says all things in verse 16 were created through him, for him. Verse 17, he is before all things, and in him all things consist. All things are held together. Jesus keeps everything together, not the atoms and protons and neutrons and quarks and quantum particles. Jesus holds all things together. And if Jesus keeps the universe together, I've discovered, have you, that he can keep me together too. He can keep me together. He keeps all things together. In, in Hebrews, again, I just read this to you, verse 3, that he's the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He holds everything together. Now, the second stanza is verse 18, where it says, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. He is preeminent over all. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, he's the head of the body, the church. Not only is Jesus from the beginning, He's the head of the church. In other words, he bought the church with his own blood. He owns the church. He controls it. And he is the beginning, firstborn notice, from the dead. When you read your Bible, you find that there were several who died but came to life. Look at your Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Elijah raised the widow of Zarephath's son. It's recorded in 1 Kings 17. Elisha, his protege, raised the Shunammite son. It's recorded in 2 Kings chapter 4. There's an interesting story about a man who had died and was cast into Elisha's sepulcher. And when this dead man's body came into contact with the bones of Elisha, according to 2 Kings 13, this man came back to life. That must have scared his friends an awful lot. In the New Testament, Jairus' daughter in Mark 5 was raised from the dead, the widow of Nain's son in Luke 7, as well as Lazarus in John 11, were all dead. They all came back to life. They all had one thing in common, though. They died once again. They were resurrected, but they died again. That must have been quite a bummer for them when you think about it. Now, Jesus is the first to be resurrected, never to die again. And it's Jesus who brings life and immortality to us. It's like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He goes on in verse 19 to say, It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Now, when you look at chapter 2, verse 9, it says, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, bodily. In him all the fullness dwells. The word fullness in the Greek language is the totality of all that God is. It dwelt in Jesus. Everything God is, Christ is. The majesty, the power, the goodness of God is manifested in and by Jesus Christ. Someone said, we have a Savior who is in no respect deficient in wisdom, power, and grace to redeem and save us. There's nothing necessary to be done in our salvation that he is not qualified to do. There's nothing which we need to enable us to perform our duties, to meet temptation, and to bear trial, which he's not able to impart. In no situation of trouble and danger will the church find that there is a deficiency in him. There's nothing lacking in Christ. Sometimes we get in a bad situation and we feel that God isn't there. God doesn't care. God won't deliver us. Well, sometimes I find myself in bad situations because I put myself in that bad situation. 
I, I resisted the Holy Spirit. I quenched him when he was saying, don't do this, don't go there. I just quenched him. I thought, oh, I can do this, no problem. Then I begin to reap what I've sown. And when I begin to reap what I've sown, because if I sow to the flesh from the flesh, I'm going to reap corruption, Paul told the Galatians. When that happens and I begin to reap what I've sown, I begin to say, God, where are you? How could you have done this? Why did you allow this? When the Lord says, I put so many roadblocks in front of you and you kept insisting on moving and moving and moving till you finally did it and now you're blaming me for that? Now you're blaming me? I mean, sometimes we'll see tragedies here in the United States. There'll be some kind of thing that happened. They like to call it, um, you know, uh, what do they call it? Uh, they're, they're God, God, some, God is somehow you know, behind all these tragedies, the hurricanes and this and that. And, uh, and we, we begin to say, God, why aren't you helping us? How come you're not helping us? Well, and the Lord, in a way, could say, well, wait a minute. You kicked me out a long time ago. You told me not, that no, you said nobody should pray to me in school. You told, you told people that Bibles ought not to be in, in, in classrooms. You don't want me part of your life. You used to take Sundays off. As a nation, you used to take Sundays off. It was a day of rest for the whole nation. I grew up in a time when when, when when, uh, when stores were closed on Sundays. I grew up in that day in California. You may not believe that, but that was true here in California. You did not have stores open on Sundays. As a matter of fact, we had a store, we call them liquor stores. We called them then. If you go back east, they call them by different names. We call them liquor stores. Why? Because they sell liquor. But we, we had liquor stores, and a Jewish man owned the liquor store down the street, and so he was the only one who had a store open on Sunday, and we would go over there. Everything else was closed. And, and we kicked God out of our schools a long time ago, didn't we? We've tried to kick him off, of, off the coinage. We've tried to kick him off of the darling God we trust. No, we don't. We've tried to take his motto off of government building. And then something happens, and, and, and we say, God, where are you? And God's just response would be, you kicked me out. You haven't wanted me. Now you do. And see, that's the problem we're having here in the United States right now, is we're trying to empty everything of the memory of God. But guess what? God's alive. You cannot empty this nation's memory of God. You can't do that. But we're trying to do that. There is no deficiency in Christ. Sometimes we'll trust people. Sometimes we'll think, well, I ought to ask them to help. They should help. The first person I need to go to on my knees with repentant heart is my God. God, help me. God help me. And then sometimes God will lay it on the heart of somebody else who will say to me, can I be of help to you? The first person, you got to learn this, that you go to is God. The first person. There's no deficiency in him. There's not anything lacking in Jesus Christ. He is all in all. All things. He can do it. What we need to, that's what Christianity is. And he goes on, and he says in verse 20, by him, he says, to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He says, by him to reconcile. The word reconcile speaks of restoring a former state of harmony to things on earth or things in heaven. The point he's making is sin affected every element of creation, corrupting and infecting it. Jesus' death was intended to bring all creation back into a state of harmony. And that includes the creation of that one new person, that one man, consisting of both Jew and Gentile. How did he do that? It says in verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross. He did it through his voluntary sacrifice. He poured out his blood for us. In Ephesians 1, verse 7, Paul said it like this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. The apostle Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. He said, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, those who in faith come to him, those of us who have bowed our knee to Christ and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, we have been cleansed by his blood. 
When you get to the last book of the, uh, the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and you look at chapter 1, verse 5, that verse speaks of Jesus who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. And that's what he's saying, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he brought us to reconciliation with him through his death by pouring out his life blood to cleanse us from all sin. He says in verse 21, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. He's speaking to Gentiles, non-Jews. They were strangers to God. They didn't know him. They didn't have his love in a personal way. They were alienated from him. They knew, they knew nothing of him. They didn't know his nature. They didn't know his attributes. They were, they were enemies. And their lives, which were described as wicked works, revealed this. The way that they lived demonstrated they didn't know God. Even a child is known by his works, whether they're good or evil. Somebody can say, oh, no, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm still, I, I love him. And yet you look at their life, not as their, their final judge to condemn them, but, but you see their life, and you know enough Bible to say this is what people are to do, and these are the things I'm not to do. And they do everything the Scripture says not to do, and yet they're saying to me that they love the Lord. And, and, and for me, it's kind of like the princess bride where, where that genius uh, keeps saying something over and over again, and finally the guy says, I don't think that word means what he thinks it means. I think that that's how people can be sometimes. They say, well, I'm a Christian. And I think, with I don't think they know what that means. Why? Because I'm their judge? No, because their works are demonstrating they have no relationship with God. I've had people tell me how much they love the Lord, that they're true Christians, while well, they're drunk talking to me about it. Now, I don't know whether or not they know the Lord or not. I'm not the judge in the final. It just at that moment, I would have every reason to wonder, I, do you know what it means to come to faith in Christ? If so, then maybe you need to put away that alcohol because look at how it is dominating your life. But there are a lot of people who run around saying, oh, I know Jesus Christ, I love the Lord. No, the Bible makes it very clear that our wicked works demonstrate that we really, we really don't know him. And these Gentiles didn't know the Lord. What they were is they were idolaters. They, they, they created gods of their own to worship. One of the Psalms, the psalmist says, eyes they have, speaking of idols, eyes they have, but they do not see. Ears they have, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they cannot smell. Mouths they have, but they do not speak. Hands they have, but they do not reach. Feet they have, but they do not walk. And then he goes on and he says, and those who make them are like them. The statues are dead, and so are their creators, because they're worshiping the creation rather than the creator who is God blessed, amen. They're worshiping the works of their hands and not the one who created all things. And they become like their idols. Isaiah mocks them when he speaks concerning the fact that the man goes out with a saw, cuts down a tree, takes it to his shop, begins to whittle it, makes it into the form of a man, and then overlays it with gold, puts it on a podium. He says, and he bows down. And he says to this dead tree that he created out of his own work, he says, and he bows down before it, and he says, you are my God. Well, that's the Gentiles. The Gentiles knew not God. They were idolaters. All that God was in terms of capable of communicating through creation, Romans 1 tells us, they could see and know every house is built by some man. He who built all things is God. They could know that there's a creator simply by looking at creation. Sometimes you can get in your car, you can take a drive, and you can see some of the most beautiful creation. Here in, in California, we have some of the most beautiful um, land that, that you're going to see. Go to Newport Beach, go to Laguna, go down south, go a little bit north, go up to uh, Big Sur, go up into Carmel, Monterey, and just stand there on the shoreline and look at the amazing beauty as you look at it, it's just gorgeous. Creation is amazing. Or you, you can go to, you name it. I mean, there's places 
here, go to the mountains and just sit down with a cup of coffee and, and smell the pine and, and just, it's gorgeous, you know? But, but that's just, that's creation. It, it cries out that there's something greater than that. And that's our God. But, but, but pagans don't. They, they worship the creation rather than the creator who is God. They've made their idols and he makes it very clear you once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. You as Gentiles had no relationship with God. You were enemies. But he goes on and he says, yet now he has reconciled, verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. In the body of his flesh through death, in the death of Jesus, we who have embraced him have regained fellowship with him. Our lives have been radically changed, transformed. He speaks concerning us being holy. To present you, verse 22, to present you holy, he also uses the word blameless and above reproach. Holy. The word holy speaks of consecration to God, dedication to him. God sees us as holy He's the one who set us apart to use us. Ephesians 1.4 says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, we should be holy without blame before him in love. The word blameless speaks of that which is without blemish, as a sacrifice without spot, morally pure. Blameless refers to our position in Christ, not just outward conduct. When we stand before God, we're clothed with Jesus' righteousness. See, you and I, none of us could ever stand before God in our own righteousness. If we tried to, it would be disastrous. But we stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. So when he looks at us, he sees what Christ has done for us. And that's why we can stand before him. He says in verse 22, above reproach, that's without a charge brought against you. Positionally, we stand before God righteous, as righteous as Jesus, and he presents us to his Father. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's what salvation's intended to do. We're brought into fellowship with God over a lifetime, and he cleanses us, and he purifies us. We're not perfect on earth, we grieve over our failures. Sometimes we can feel that we're truly not saved. You see, truly saved people can experience a sense that maybe I'm not. I got saved two, three weeks after being saved. I wasn't on the high that I had been. When I got saved, I was on a, just an emotional high. You know, I, it, it dawned on me that all my sins had been cleansed, that I'd been forgiven, and and I had a lot of sins, and so I was very grateful to God. I remind myself of, of something that occurred in the ministry of my pastor Chuck when he was baptizing people, and, and he was speaking to, the, to the, the group before he baptized them. And, and he said, you know, the water symbolizes your death burial in Christ. You've been washed, and you've been cleansed, and you're buried. And, and then when you come out, it represents your new life in Jesus Christ. And he was sharing about baptism and then Chuck spoke about how a young man came up to him and said to, to Chuck, hold me down a long time, Chuck. I've got a lot that needs to be buried. Well, I understand that. I, and so do you. I understand that. Hold me down a long time. I've got a lot to be, to be buried. But you know what? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, not just from some sin, not just from particular sins or sins before. They're all sins. Aren't you glad that God has washed you and cleansed you from all of your sins? He doesn't bring one of them up to remind you. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he, as he removed our sins from us, never again shall he bring them up to us. And so your conscience can accuse you because you're not perfect, because you're not doing everything the way that you'd like to. You wake up sometimes and, and you may be reminded, I'm reminded quite often of my past life. I'm married. No, I'm, 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 I'm reminded quite often of my past by my own conscience. Almost, if not every, almost every morning, almost every morning, 
And I've been a Christian for a long time now. Almost every morning, I will wake up, and one of the first things, I will remember something I did that was wrong. One of the very first things that come into my mind. That's the truth before Christ. Almost every morning, I will wake up and remember some bad thing I did. And my heart gets grieved. But you know, John said, if, 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 your, heart, if your heart accuses you, God is greater than your heart. He knows all things. Christ washed me. And I, and I, will, I will begin my morning by saying that. I, I can almost tell you exactly what I say. I say it almost every day. God, thank you for the new life I have in you. Thank you that my sins have been washed and are cleansed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I am not that person I used to be. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are become new. You see, so we're not perfect on earth. Don't kill yourself about your imperfection. You're not saving yourself. You needed to be saved. That's why Jesus gave his life up for you. Now, he didn't save you so you could return to the vomit or the mud. He saved you to remove you from that. He gave his grace to you so you could be victorious over that. And yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can be different. Why can't you? Your sin is not greater than God's grace. Never forget that. God's grace is above all things, and Jesus' blood washes you, and God's powerful Holy Spirit indwells you, and God's word directs you, and God's body of Christ, the friends, support you and encourage you, and you can make it. Your life is different because of him. When you came and you knelt at that, at that cross and you said, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. God says, I am merciful to you. You are forgiven. You are are cleansed. Get up. Sin no more. Go your way and speak of me. That's what he does. That's Christianity. That's what God has called us to. And we need to understand that today. And he says he's going to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. The purpose of the atonement was for him to present the redeemed to God cleansed. In Ephesians 5:27, he did this to present her, the church, to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. So we're presented holy, no longer deserving blame, no longer unworthy, and we are presented. In Revelation 19, 7 and 8, let us be glad, rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. His wife has made herself ready. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. He says in verse 23, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. If you continue, notice verse 23, if you continue in the faith, the words if you continue, that's not a warning, it's an assumption. It's an assumption on the part of Paul. They have been faithful up until this point. He's assuming they're gonna to continue to do so. You see, you persevere. If one person is saved, they continue in the relationship with Christ. Salvation's evidenced by their firm continuance in the hope of the gospel. They're not moved away from the hope of the gospel, he says, because there were seducers who were entering in trying to draw them away. You're not permitting yourselves to be seduced by false teachers. Now, that would be a word to those who are listening to the false teachers. Those who have been born again resist the deception of false teachers. When I first got saved, I've shared this in the past, when I first got saved, brand new Christian, 20 years old, hippie, know nothing, I get saved. I have a knock on the door. There are two Jehovah's Witnesses at the door wanting to talk to me. I don't know anything other than once I was lost, now I'm found. I thought they were Christians. They walk away. I said, I just don't think I believe what you're saying. And I began to encounter people over the years from there. 
kind of regularly. It's interesting how before I was a Christian, nobody really talked to me about Jesus Christ. I really didn't encounter many people who were members of false religions or anything, and that didn't happen. It only began to really happen after I got saved. Isn't that interesting? But it's true, probably, probably true with you too. You were pretty much left alone because you already belonged to the enemy, but now that you've gotten saved, he begins to send his little servants over, and they knock on your door, they talk to you at work, they work next to you, some, they, they, they do this, and, and they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian too, and they confuse you. We've had them come into, this, into our church, we've had them come into our parking lot and put their, their, uh, their information on windshields here in, in, one of the reasons that we, right here in church, one of the reasons we have parking lot attendants is because they walk through that parking lot patrolling because we have cult members who come onto our property and they'll put their, their, their information on cars. We've had them leave them in the pews and we have people who come in on Wednesday here at the church and they will, or Tuesday, and they come in and they, they, they police and take care of things because that happens uh, frequently enough. That just is true. And when you get saved, you know, before you probably didn't have very many people, if at all, talking to you about God and Jesus, but after you got saved, suddenly everybody's a theologian and everybody's got faith and everybody wants to talk and, and that's what happens. And so I got out of the army two years in the military. I get out. And I'm at the house that I'm renting and there's a knock on the door. I open the door. There are two ladies there. Hi, we'd like to talk to you about God. Great, let's talk. I enjoy talking about God. They come in, sit down, and they begin sharing with me. They say, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, oh. I knew very little, if anything, about Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, really? And they started talking to me. And I said, well, you know, I I'm a Christian. Oh, are you really? I said, yes, I am. I said, I gave my heart to Christ, and I've been following him, just got out of the army. And, and they said, oh. And, and I said, yeah, and I believe that Jesus is God in the flesh second person of the Trinity. Oh no, and bang, you know, all the smiles came off. Oh no, no, that's not true. And they start telling me that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, that Jesus is the first creation of God, and, and they begin to say these things. And, I, and I'm, I'm still new in the Lord. I, I, I say, no, I don't think that what you're saying is, oh no, this woman kept doing it just like that. Oh no, it's what the Bible says. And she put a little finger at me. That's what the Bible says. I said, no, well, I believe, oh, no, the Bible says. I told Marie, honey, stop that. No, she goes, the woman kept on doing that. It's what the Bible says. It's what the Bible says. And I said, well, I'll be honest with you. I don't agree with you, but I can't give you reasons why. I said, but I'd like to talk to you again. Could you, could you come back? Oh, we'd love to. I said, please do. They left, and I went to a store, a Christian bookstore. I'd never been to one before. I, again, I'm a brand new Christian. I went to a Christian bookstore, and I got Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults. And I came home. He's got over 100 pages on the origin and theology of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I read that 100 plus pages, and I marked it and memorized some responses. And I was waiting. I mean, when they came to the door, I had a bazooka, <laughs> an M16, I had a knife in my teeth, come on in. <laughs> and they walked in and sat down, and I said, you know, I've been thinking about what you told me last time. And she goes, yes, we only teach what the Bible says. She said it again. And I said, well, can you show me where the Bible says that Jesus Christ came back invisibly in the early 1900s and that he is now governing the church from Brooklyn, New York? Can you show me where it says that? Well, you know, we have, no, I didn't ask you that. You, last time you were here, you said, this is what the Bible says. I just want to know where does the Bible say Jesus is ruling the church invisibly from Brooklyn in the Watchtower organization? She says, well, I said, here's another one for you. Where does the Bible say that Michael the Archangel is Jesus Christ? Well, the word, she says, Michael means who is like God. I said, I know that. I did some research. I know that. But where does it specifically say 
that Michael and Jesus are the same. Because when Michael disputed with the devil over the body of Moses, he dared not render any accusation, but rather said, the Lord rebuked thee. Yet Jesus in Matthew 4, when he spoke to Satan, said, get thee behind me. Now, when did Michael ever get the power to say, get thee behind me? And she says, oh, well. And I said, no, I wanted, I know, I just enjoyed myself. And then <laughs> when, when we got in, she finally got up and got in. Well, I can see this conversation is going nowhere. She closes her material. She summons her little friend to go with her. And as she's walking out, I stand by the door and I'm saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. And you need him. And that, see, I've been doing this since I was 23 years old. It's true. There is truth. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died on a cross. He was buried in a grave. Three days later, he was resurrected. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father and he intercedes on behalf of us. He is coming again for us. He will come and take the church to be with him. It's any day now. And so the enemy creeps in from the beginning to try and destroy this. And that's why Paul says he is the preeminent one. He is number one. There is nobody else like him. He is God in the flesh. And that's why we worship him. That's how it works. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. And he closed by saying this gospel. He said, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister we have a confident expectation. We will spend eternity in the presence of God in heaven. And that's our hope. It's revealed by the gospel. Psalm 16 verse 9 says, My heart is glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope. Psalm 17 15, As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. And Paul said, I have preached this to every creature. The whole human race needs to hear this, Jew and Gentile alike. To both of these, the gospel has preached and is being preached. Salvation is being offered. And he said, this is my calling. I am faithfully doing this. And this is our calling. And we must faithfully do the same.